So it is my great pleasure now to introduce Kshama Savant. Um, she is a faculty member at Seattle Central Community College in the area of economics. Maybe you'll get fortunate enough to take her class. And um, she's here today to talk about $15 minimum wage in Seattle. So welcome, Kashana. Thank you, Kelly. And thanks to the award-winning librarians of our college who have kept this series alive since the first time we did it when Occupy Seattle moved to the campus. And I don't know how many of you were there or how many of you recall, but we did that, the union did that as a tactic to protect the occupation from police intimidation. So we had an all-night teach-in, and that's how this all started. And I really congratulate the librarians for keeping it alive with such socially relevant issues. Uh, and I'm really honored to be here back in campus. I really miss it. I miss being here. And I wanted to also thank everybody for being here, engaging in a very, very important discussion. And what I'm going to be talking about today is, is going to touch on very much on where we are today, not just about you know, why we need 15, because I think, I would assume that the majority of people here understand why we need this struggle, but more on where the struggle is now and what challenges we're going to be facing. Uh, and I would ask everybody to think about, you know, just to begin the discussion, think about where we are today. Just contrast the political landscape of today in Seattle to where we, where we were this time last year. Virtually no politicians were talking about $15 an hour. The question wasn't even on the horizon. Uh, for most of the mainstream, certainly for the corporate media. And what has happened now is that the number 15 has etched itself on the political landscape of Seattle. And not just Seattle, but the entire nation has been electrified by what's happening here today and what happened at SeaTac. And until now, leaving aside some notable exceptions, most politicians just wanted to ignore, you know, just wanted to, wanted to go away. And it wasn't just 15, it was all the burning questions of economic inequality. You know, they don't want to touch it with a 10-foot pole because it's all a question of, uh, you know, what your political consultants <coughs> tell you in terms of what is viable. And that, is, that goes to the heart of what's wrong with the political system. But now what's happened is that they're all scrambling to make sure that they are not left behind and are known as supporters of 15. So it's important for us to understand, how did this happen? How did we get here? Clearly, the starting point was the anger and frustration at the system itself, the growing poverty for all working people, especially people of color, and the decades of being pushed to the bottom. And I'm sure everybody saw the really stunning, but not at all surprising statistic that 85 people in the world own the same wealth that is owned by half the population of the planet, that's 3.5 billion people. And I don't know if that doesn't speak to the dysfunctionality and crisis in our global system, then I don't know what does. But closer to home, closer to our campus, we've, we've been engaged in a struggle on attacks against teachers' unions, against budget cuts, against the, uh, the, the you know, the uh, vicious circle of rising tuition, uh, uh, cuts in funding for financial aid, cuts in uh, funding for uh, classes, and the rise in student loans. As Carlos said, we're also, we're, this is all part of a larger framework of privatization that's happening with the, commu the word community being removed from the college or the attempts to remove it. We really have to fight it. But when you sign Carlos's petition, remember that it is not just about a name. We're not struggling just to keep the word community in our college, but we're struggling to keep the community in our college. And that is what this is all about. Um, but, the, but the point is that none of this is new. Is any of this news to anybody who has any sense of how the system works? It's not. This has been happening for decades. So what changed? What was, what was the key variable that made everything look different in the span of a few years? 
And as far as $15 is concerned, in a span of a few months, making it on the top of the political agenda, all of the uh, anger, frustration, all of that coming to a you know boil, uh, coming uh, having an outward expression through the Occupy movement had a lot to do with it. And then following that, we had the fast food workers movement, the movement in SeaTac for $15 an hour, and our campaign, Socialist Alternatives campaign for Seattle City Council, where we showed that it is possible to be victorious with a completely complete rejection of the corporate political agenda. We didn't try to make any uh, sort of tightrope walk between corporate politics and grassroots politics. We completely rejected corporate politics in, and we unapologetically fought for grassroots politics. And the example of a victory like that is what working people need. It's not that things need to get worse. You often hear that, you know, things just need to get worse and then people will move into action. No, things are pretty bad for most of us. What we need is a shot in the arm to propel us into taking charge of our own lives and saying, I'm going to fight against injustice. And if that means going against business, then that is what it's going to be. And I think the, that, that understanding crystallizing into an organized struggle is what is making that change. See, that didn't happen just because there were a number of people who were angry about economic injustice. See, that happened because the labor movement and activists and the workers, airport workers on the ground, got together and had an organized campaign of door knocking, leafletting, talking to people, talking to the media, a very organized and cohesive struggle to make it happen. Our campaign for city council was the same. We, at the end of the day, we, did, we weren't just a few people from Socialist Alternative. We had 450 people all over the city helping us actively with the campaign. And that's what it takes to win victories for the grassroots. And what we've seen so far is that the movement is leading and the politicians are following. Now, while the politicians are trying not to be left behind, they're doing so tentatively because their loyalties at the end of the day rest at the feet of big business. And if you hear most people what they're saying, most politicians, they're saying, well, yes, I agree with 15, but we need to study it. We need committees and we need, you know, we need discussion. And no doubt, we need a lot of discussion. Today's discussion is an important discussion we're having. But we don't need any study anymore to prove an undeniable fact. Seattle is unaffordable to the majority of working people in this city. And you have to have the courage to say that every time people tell you we need studies. We don't need a study. Our lives prove it that we cannot live in this city anymore unless we make a big change. What about business? Business is on the back foot. Business has lost the public debate on minimum wage. Whether they like it or not, $15 an hour is on the agenda. And, you know, they hate it as, they hate to even have to talk about it, but they don't have a choice. Why? Because the vast majority of Seattle's people are supporting $15 an hour. How many of you saw the poll that just came out? Very few hands are going up. <laughs> we just had a poll in Seattle uh, whose results were uh, publicly declared a few weeks ago. How much support do you think $15 an hour has in Seattle? Probably 80%. But the poll indicates that 68% of the people of Seattle support a straight up 15. No exemptions, no loopholes no carve-outs. That is a decisive public mandate in support of $15 an hour. We have to not lose sight of the fact that we have public opinion on our side. This is not the time to run scared. This is the time to declare that, that, you know, that the, the people of Seattle understand why it is necessary to have $15 an hour. So what is business going to do now? 
Complained. Well, they, the question of raising prices happens after 15 is one, right? We haven't won it yet, my brothers and sisters. Let's not forget that yet. Um, <laughs> what they will do is what they are starting to do, which is try underhanded attacks. They will say, as they are saying now, many people from the business world, I support 15, but I am worried about unintended consequences. They will say that this movement for 15, while its heart is in the right place, its head is buried in the sand. What about small nonprofits, small businesses? Uh, what, you know, what about all these people? And according to their narrative, $15 an hour will hurt the most vulnerable people, the least skilled workers, uh, and you know, and and people of color. Black people will lose their jobs, according to them. This week has been a beginning of the counterattacks of corporate media against $15 an hour, and it really was only a question of time when they would start this. I don't know how many of you have seen, but it would be instructive for you to look at the articles in the Seattle Times that have been published, two of them in the last four days, where uh, you know one of them is about how $15 an hour is going to destroy small businesses, and the other is about how if we pass $15 an hour, then nonprofits will have to cut their services. And they are asking us about compromise. They are now vilifying the movement for, you know, this. what's happened here is that the, for the first time in decades, people, working people have stood up and stand, are, you know, are standing up for our own interests. And this movement is starting to come to life. It's not so easy with all the money that they have it's not easy for business to simply change your mind, change the way you think. They have to spread lies and rumors. And so what they're now doing is that they're vilifying the movement. They're vilifying you for standing up for your rights. They're calling us dogmatic, inflexible, rigid. What is our response going to be? We have to say that working people, as a matter of fact, have been too flexible for four decades. That has been the problem. We have been too willing to compromise. We have accepted massive cuts to education, healthcare, human services, and we have accepted stagnating wages. We have accepted getting battered decade after decade, and we have accepted being hurled down the abyss of expanding poverty. They ask us about compromise, but you know, and we'll talk about what that means, but think about it, my sisters and brothers. The fact that they cannot openly oppose 15 and they're asking you to compromise is itself a sign of a partial victory for this movement. Let's not forget that. And we and 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 we have recognized that the only thing that they can do is, is to attack us. So one of the things that big business is saying is that small nonprofits will be badly affected. They say they want us to think that they are speaking up in support of small nonprofits that provide essential human services and in support of small businesses. These are crocodile tears. <laughs> this, is a, this, this is a disingenuous statement. This is a blatant exploitation of the real plight that human services and small businesses face. That plight is real. Human services have been grossly underfunded. With every passing year, they lose their funding steadily, while the need for their services keeps growing because the economy keeps battering more and more people with poverty, with homelessness, with the need for services. The people working at nonprofits have for decades been providing these urgent services with very little to gain. They are making poverty wages themselves. And many small businesses, especially businesses owned by people of color, face insurmountable obstacles in this economy because of skyrocketing rent, because of the skyrocketing costs of capital investment. You know, if you're a small, if you're starting trying to start a small business and you want a loan, it's it's a mountain to climb, and you face a regressive tax system. Instead of being on the defensive. We have to recognize 
that this is an entire hypocrisy, this false choice that we are presented between the need for workers to have a decent standard of living and the need for human services to make sure that the most vulnerable amongst us have a basic protection. But this is not just hypocritical, this is scandalous. It's a cheap and despicable tactic to pit workers and people needing human services against each other. And often it is working people who need those services because they're getting paid so less that they qualify for these services. We have to reject this dishonest narrative, this fairy tale in which $15 is the monster that is coming to get all the little nonprofits and family businesses. Part of this mythology is that all of these nonprofits and small businesses are otherwise happily coexisting in this corporate dominated world, which is not true. We know that. They have been struggling for decades, and that is not because workers are getting a living wage. That is happening together with the fact that workers' wages are stagnating because that is the way the capitalist system works unless we fight back. We cannot accept this false choice. We need full funding for human services. We need protection for the most struggling small businesses. We need livable wages. And we need affordable housing, a clean environment, funding for public education, full funding for transportation, and a clean environment. If business cared one whit for the concerns of human services funding, we would not have spent the last several decades seeing human services funding drop off a cliff while business profits soared at the same time to historic levels. The solution to human services funding is not poverty wages, but taxing the billions of profits being raked in by big business multinationals who are sucking our society dry through corporate subsidies, tax loopholes, grotesque executive compensation, and in this state, an almost non-existent taxation on corporations and the wealthy. CEO salary averages at $7,000 an hour. And they have the nerve to say that we are somehow demanding too much by asking for $15 an hour. How, who here knows how much $15 an hour amounts to if you have a full-time job? Around $30,000 a year. Before tax, exactly. And given the regressive taxation, you'll be paying lots of taxes. So what we're saying is that an ordinance or an initiative for 15 must absolutely address the needs of genuinely small businesses and city-funded small human service providers, but that cannot happen on the backs of workers. That has to be paid by big business and the wealthy. But let us be honest, in reality, this is not even just about nonprofits or small businesses. These arguments, or pseudo-arguments, reflect a general opposition to any legislation that benefits the 99% rather than business profits. I can promise you that if the central debate today was not 15, but funding increase for human services or for providing subsidies for small business, we would have been treated to a different sort of fairy tale about the looming crisis to society if we did that. You know, there would be some crisis that would be happening according to them. The fact is, no matter what real crisis of social and economic inequality we would deal with, business will tell us a sad story of imminent catastrophe that they will face. Look at how Boeing extracted $9 billion from the state. This is the single largest corporate subsidy in US history. They did that by saying that you know, the economy is going into crisis or Boeing is going to go into crisis unless they are able to carry out their highway robbery. Do not believe for one moment that if we were to turn our attention now to funding nonprofits, that business would support us in raising the funds for human services. It is simply a ruse to disarm the movement and to sow divisions amongst us. Every significant struggle for justice is met with attacks from business right here in Seattle and in Washington State. Think of all the things that business has opposed 
but they had to agree to because there was so much public mandate. They claim that the ban on plastic bags would be disastrous to them. They claim that the paid sick leave would be disastrous to them. They claim that tying the minimum wage to inflation rate would be bad for them. They claim that inclusion of tipped workers into the state minimum wage in the 80s would be bad for them. In every instance, they had their imaginary, custom-made reasons all ready to throw out. And if we accepted these lies, these pretended sympathies, we, make no mistake, we would be accepting defeat and a continuation of the status quo that works for only a few and has been disastrous for the rest of us. We should be prepared mentally for more attacks on business and we have to be prepared with our responses. When they ask us about compromise, we have to remind them that workers have already compromised by demanding only 15. It's not a living wage. We're demanding something less than that. Remind them that a strong 15 measure has a huge public mandate. Point, it, point them to the polls. And demand that business and the city establishment put their own proposal on the table. Yes, we need to have a discussion about how best to support small businesses and nonprofits. We need to talk about how big business is going to pay for that. There is no shortage of policy options for this. I just wanted to quote uh, something very interesting from uh, Goldie, who writes for The Stranger. He says, this is from, I think, yesterday or, or this morning, I can't remember. He says, as for, this is, he's responding to the whole idea of, you know, small nonprofits will be affected. He says, as for how to pay a living wage to all those college-educated social workers currently earning only 1275 yeah, raise taxes. Of course, raise taxes. We underfund human services to the point where we impoverish those who are serving the poor. The status quo is indefensible. As for which tax to raise, here's an idea I first pitched nearly a decade ago. A job tax, an income tax on the salaries earned by athletes during their duty days in the city. Now this is Goldie's opinion. I'm not necessarily saying that this is the best, and he's not saying this is the best either. But the point he is making is that it is dishonest of business to claim that there is no avenue at all to make this work, and it would be a defeat on our part to accept that argument. We have to counter it by saying there is any number of things we could do. But if you, as soon as you start talking about taxing corporations and the wealthy, people will tell you that, well, that's illegal. First of all, I'm not sure that we have no avenue available. If you want to have a serious discussion about that, we should talk about it. But that reflects a, a larger phenomenon that happens under capitalism. Under capitalism, the two corporate parties, at the behest of business, have carefully crafted regulations everywhere in the country that prevent any sort of ability, actual ability, for the society to provide a decent standard of living. So there was a movement for rent control in Seattle two decades ago. What was the response of the state legislature? They outlawed rent control. There, was, you know, there have been many moves to have a tax on the wealthy. That has been outlawed. So we are told that it's illegal to have rent control, illegal to tax corporate profits, illegal to tax the wealthy. There is a systematic shutdown of every option to address inequality. If we accept these rules as written, then we are going to accept this false violin music that is going to play every time working people move into struggle. I would be happy to hear how business is planning to take less profit to support human services. That's a discussion I'd like to have. Or lower their bloated executive salaries. I'd be happy to hear their ideas to make sure that workers get a living wage and human services are funded. I don't see them lobbying in Olympia to tax themselves <laughs> so that workers get a decent wage. And they accept a slightly smaller rate of profit. We will not get victory in 15 if we let them divide us. It is our job to keep the movement growing. And it is my job to help you 
find your own inner strength, to find your own leadership, to understand that unless each and every person in this room makes up their minds right now that you're going to play a leadership role in this movement, we are not going to see a real $15 measure, let alone all the other bigger things that we are going to be fighting for. And as a teacher, I can tell you that while your grades in the classroom are extremely critical, there is no better education for you than being an active part of a movement and learning to play a leading role where you are the opinion driver. From now until July, your task is to be the opinion driver. Do not let business or Fox News or McDonald's or Taco Bell drive the opinion. You have to drive it. It's your task. How do we do it? We have a grassroots campaign called 15 Now, which has already been launched. We had a huge rally on February 15, where we uh, inaugurated the action groups. We now have seven district action groups that have already met to talk about how to do this. Every person here, and I'm sure it's almost all of you, who is not part of an action group for 15 Now, has to sign up to be part of 15 Now, because if you don't do this, it is not going to happen. I can do as much as I can in my power as a city council member to give a wide microphone to these issues, but my, the source of my power is entirely in your hands. That is the only source of power I have. Because I am challenging the status quo, and my power lies outside City Hall, not inside City Hall. So I appeal to you all to... That's why I don't need <laughs> I appeal to you all to become part of the movement, and uh, you know, ask me whatever questions you like. And I know that somebody from 15 now is here, who's also a student at Seattle Central Community College, who wants to talk to you about uh, the action group that he's trying to set up on campus. So I want to invite Brandon first to talk about it briefly, and then you can take questions. Yes, of course, I'm happy. joining 15 now and giving back and <coughs> basically spreading the word and creating new ideas to spread the word. So yeah. <laughs> now go to speeches. Yeah. That's how it's going. Thank you. 
and provide essential human services. It's extremely important to, to make sure that these small nonprofits have full funding. But the reality is that most of these nonprofits have seen falling funding for their services while the needs for their services have grown. Because more and more people are now made homeless. They're more jobless people. So, that, and that funding is not even, for most of them, is not even tied to the cost of living. So while their costs are going up with the cost of living, their funding is, is flat. So we have to fight for full funding for human services, but always point out that neither small businesses nor small nonprofits can be supported on the backs of working people. That is not working. That has failed. And we have to tax big business and the super wealthy. And also, in terms of you know content information, I mean, we are trying to make a lot of information available on 15now.org, but I can tell you that the minimum wage has been increased many times in many cities and many states. Every time that happened, business was squawking about how it's going to be bad for them. And there is, there is not a single case to prove that, it was, that increasing the minimum wage was any kind of disaster. In reality, the way capitalism works, it relies on working people having the power to consume. And you can't consume much if your salary is frozen across decades. Well, it's not so much a question. It's more like a, a statement. Uh, you know, Z Pizza across the way there. Uh, I talked to the manager of the place, so I've been having discussions before this all started to happen like this. And uh, she said, first of all, that she thought you had your head in the clouds and not uh, feet on the ground of reality, and that she's a small business, and that if she had to, if this $15 happened, she would have to shut, the, shut down, and she said that this would become a ghost town. She also said she belonged to a co coalition of small businesses, and they felt like they'd been attacked one thing after another, the tearing up of the street. And I remember before the $15 thing were happening, she was complaining how business was being hurt because people weren't coming in because the streets were being turned up to the light rail and then the taxes that were happening. And she said a lot of, not just her, but other people in this coalition were very upset with this. And she also said that she would gladly open up her books to you. And if you could tell her how to do it, you'll win her over. <laughs> I know she talked about opening the books because uh, I w I, that is what I would say. I would say that if, if a small business is claiming that they cannot stay afloat, meaning they actually will be making steady losses and they have to close down, then I would say that we have to have uh, a way of you know, looking at the books to see if that is true. And if that is so, then I would say, look, this is not a question of whether or not you, uh, as a small business owner, can or business owner in general, get to make you know 10% profit versus 15% of profit. That is, I don't see that as my, I don't see my obligation or any activist obligation as trying to make sure that the profit to business owners is maximized. Because the more the profit is maximized, the less workers are paid. That's just the mathematics of capitalism. So you know you. You and I, we have to be clear. It is a conflict of interest. It is a class war. But always remember that we did not start this class war. They did. And our side has been, uh, you know, as I was just quoting a writer named Barbara Aaron Wright who said that yes, it has been class war. And so far, it has been something like aerial bombardment against the working class. You know, we have been pushed more and more to the bottom. And so I would say that if small business owners care about social justice and they agree that workers should earn a living wage but they cannot afford to pay, then join with us, open your books, join with us in the movement and let's make sure, let's work together, let's fight together to make sure that big business pays. But I don't accept the argument it's a false argument to say that because I am supposedly going, as a small business owner, I'm going to shut down, you should stop fighting for 15. No. The cost of living to you as a worker is no different whether you work at a small business or a large business. 
you still face the same cost of rent. It is your right to demand a livable wage. And as far as this idea that you know, we have to... As far as this idea that Seattle will become a ghost town if we win 15, oh my gosh. <laughs> Name me one city that has actually become a ghost town. Detroit. That is not because workers are being paid, you know, wages that allows them to own mansions and jets and Porsches. It's because the economy of capitalism itself is prone to go into crisis every few years. And it just so happens that the recession that we saw unfolding in 2008 is the big doozy. It's, it's the biggest one since the Great uh, Depression. That's why this one has been called the Great Recession. So crisis and you know destruction is written into the DNA of capitalism. So if you want to avoid a ghost town, let's fight against capitalism itself. And I can promise you there is not a single example anywhere where minimum wage was increased and the city became a ghost town. If anything, it allowed the city to thrive even more because the reality is that the same small business who are complaining depend on you going and spending at their business so that they get their profits. for big corporations. So they choose four people to be there. They choose a fast food worker, they choose a small business owner, and they choose one economy in favor of $15 an hour, and they choose another person who was against. So one of the things that I asked them why, they, why the big corporation wasn't there, like what wasn't a representative from them there, because they the one who employ almost all the people, and they the one who pay to them. Like I was working for Subway, now it's the biggest chain in the United States and the, around the world bigger than McDonald's now. But something that I can tell to us about such breaks, right now you, we just see like they need to go in nine billion dollars, that's a lot. Why do they don't spend that money in education? Or when they do charity, what do charity really mean? Tax break for big corporations and they have publicity for free? And they look very good to the community when they get this, uh, these big uh, announcements that they are helping the world, but they are getting a lot of tax breaks from the government, and they are getting publicity. So a small business doesn't have this privilege, and they need to be regulations, I think, in the government, but the government is, they don't really want to do these things. When people like Shama came and represent people is when these things happen. So to make these things happen, we need to choose people like her, and we need to support her. We need to support people like Shama, and we need to support them because if we don't support it, like, if we don't support it, this doesn't happen, and we need to be there to support this. We need to be able to give our faces for it, and they will put whatever argument they will put. They will put a lot of arguments, like Shama say, a lot of arguments against it, because they want to keep the 1%, want to keep being the 1%, and they want to still have 99% of people, and average America do $25,000 a year, and they work more hard than ever. 
is the second more hard workers in the United in the world. So when you see these big gaps in equality for who we're really working, oh, so we need to support and choose people like Shama, people that really fight and give the face for us. Because the ones that are there right now, they are giving the face but for other interests or for their own interests, not for people. So it's our choice to choose who to represent us and who to support too. Thank you. Hi, my name is Joshua. Um, I used to work for corporations like Walmart, Department of Defense. What is the plan to, what is the structure? What model do we follow? What city has actually increased the minimum wage to, let's say, higher and have made progress? Do you know the structure? Are we setting a trend? I'll leave you with that. That's a very good point. Are, are we setting a trend? We are. We are absolutely setting a trend. The, all, all the eyes of the nation are on Seattle. None of our names will be remembered, but if we win a strong $15 measure, the fact that we won and the political battle that we engage in to make that happen, that will go down in history. So we are actually, right now, participating in the, in the in, in making history, but to make history, it takes hard work. We have to be, to get down to the brass tacks. You have to make sacrifices in your personal life. <laughs> you know, when, when, when Boeing gives millions of dollars to its favored candidates, that's not a sacrifice for the Boeing executives. They have a lot of money. A million year, a million there, who cares, right? Because they get three times that in, in, in terms of lobbying victories. For us, to make a donation or to make a contribution of time is a sacrifice because time is also money for working people, for students. I know many of my own students at Seattle Central work and go to school. Your time is precious because you're trying to make something better for yourself, which you should absolutely do. But don't forget that what's good for you is also this fight for 15 because you know we are all going to either go down or we're all either going to, you know, or we're going to reverse the race to the bottom and make something good for ourselves. And we are absolutely setting the trend because what happens in Seattle will get replicated elsewhere. That's another argument for people who say, well, you know, what if well, Seattle's wages go up? What about other places? No, it, the, the, it doesn't, politics doesn't work in a linear fashion like that. People are watching and listening, and it's ordinary people and their movements that make change happen. You know, that's how we want gay marriage. That's how we won any struggle. And so right now, people are watching us. They're going to learn from our struggles. And if we are successful in establishing a really strong $15 measure, that will be replicated. Likewise, if we came in and let business carve out exemption after exemption, such that you know the measure is 15 in name only, but it has so many holes, like Swiss cheese, that will be replicated too. So always remember that your the need for you to get involved in 15 now and in the campaign is greater than just Seattle, because what we do here will set the stage for everywhere else. So we better get it right here so that working people everywhere else, people who are much worse off than in Seattle, people in the South, working people in the South, <coughs> who are waiting with bated breath for, for this to happen there too. We better get it right here so that we are able to fight for our brothers and sisters everywhere. And as far as how we're going to do it, what the structure is going to be, we, you know, we have started that conversation, I have started that conversation. We need to be part of that. That's the role of 15 now. The role of 15 now is not just going door knocking, but to build a movement that is big enough, that is powerful enough that we set the agenda. We decide, you know, like you said, what is the structure? What goes in the bill? We have to decide. And the way we are going to decide is if we are powerful enough and enough in solidarity. I'm sure there will be differences amongst us, no doubt. But that's not the point. The point is that we have a lot in common. And if we can come together and really rock Seattle out of recognition, 
and say, you know, show that this is how a movement is built, that's what's going to make it happen. And in that, to that, to that, I would like to remind everybody that 15 now, which by the way is is, is now a, you know it's a coalition of many many organizations and individuals who are supporting it, and we have many volunteers. We need what we need is to have big actions. So there's many coming up. One I wanted to let you know. I hope you all show up there on March 5th. At 6 p.m., Wednesday, March 5th at 6 p.m., at the Seattle Town Hall on 8th and Seneca, the city council that I am part of is having its first meeting, public meeting on the minimum wage. Please be there and make yourself heard, whether it's at the microphone or with a picket sign. You have to make sure you're there. After that, we have a whole week of action in March, culminating in March 15th, day of action. We want at least a thousand, if not thousand people at the rally in March on March 15th. And you have a role to play in helping us build for that. And after that, we have May Day, where we want, we want to go out with our immigrant brothers and sisters and fight for immigrant, immigrant rights and for the rights of all working people. I have the word that we have room for two more questions, and those people have been identified over here. <laughs> Please keep them to the point. Uh, on the subject of structures and in addition to small businesses, is there currently a group to both assuage and field the concerns that small businesses might be presenting? Um, there's uh, like for Zeke's Pizza and people like that. Um, I guess is there currently a forum for them to bring their concerns forward for a movement like this? Well, I, I have no doubt that they have their own forums. I've, I've been hearing of a lot of meetings that they're having. I want to—I I mean, I, I want to make sure everybody understands this. Business has no shortage of forums. That's the voice that is mostly heard. Business has Seattle Times columnists writing for them. We don't. Our primary concern should be creating a massive forum for ourselves, for the interests of working people. The way we do that is by building a grassroots movement that nobody can ignore. That is how we got here, that is how we got to this point, by refusing to be ignored, and by forcing our voices to be heard. And that should be our primary concern. And through that, I have no doubt that there will be, there are lots of, lots of extremely well-meaning, justice-oriented small businesses who want to get this right. But it is, for, it is up to us to initiate that movement and for them to join. <laughs> um, my question is, um, being a single mom myself, that if my pay went up to $15 an hour, yes, it would be wonderful, but um, other problems would arise for me. Um, food subsidy would be cut, child subsidy would be cut. So I would, I'd be making more, but I wouldn't make enough to replace the um, subsidy that I lost. So with that said, I, I do think that the $15 an hour raise is great, but I'm wondering what, will there be movements and other, um, will the issues be brought to light of, you know, single parents like myself and my friends who, if we make, if we do make $15 an hour, we do lose our subsidies and we can't afford to cover losing. I am so glad. What's your name? Sophia. Sophia, thank you so much for bringing that point up. I think this is an important point we need to bring into consideration, and she does deserve an applause. So <laughs> See, you, 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 you gave an example of why I'm insisting that you should be part of the movement. Oh, thank you. Because you are the best representative for yourself. And this is this is a question we have to deal with. I mean, I, 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 I'm not claiming that I have every detail ironed out in my head about all the things that we need to do. But it is by creating this movement and by you being a participant in the action groups that we can highlight those concerns, make sure that they don't get <coughs> left behind, and see if we can accommodate that in the actual language of the bill. Raise the uh, ceiling for the subsidies. That is something that I would support, absolutely. But whether we can get that or not, it's going to depend on how strong our voice is. It's not going to be enough for me to say it, you know. 
We need all, all the single moms who, and single parents in general who are struggling and will need these subsidies who have to absolutely be there. See, that, and that's the thing, you know, right now, if we don't do this, and if you don't become part of this and argue for 15 and an increase in the ceiling and subsidies, then what will happen is that uh, business will use, that is yet another thing, that, and that's a very common thing that they bring up. Well, you know, what about single moms? What about uh, women of color? You know, they are going to suffer. And we, it's our job to point out that women of color are suffering right now. This economy doesn't work for single moms. Single moms are struggling. And if we don't fight back, the struggle is going to intensify and our standards of living are going to only fall. And we should not pretend that $15 an hour is a solution to every problem, but it is a beginning. So we have to do two things. One, try our best to see if we can in include those things in the language. I can't promise you that in the sense that it depends on how powerful we are to dictate the terms. You know, I would like for us to be, and that's in your hands. But the second thing is to remember that the movement for 15 is not just about 15 itself. Like I said, politics does not work in a linear fashion. Because people are enthused and passionate, they have become part of this movement, that passion is not just going to die out because we did one thing. That passion, right now, when I talk to people, I can see the change. When people ask me, wait a minute, but shouldn't we be talking about affordable housing? Why aren't you? I, I've been asked by a lot of people, it's funny because you know when we started the campaign, people told us, don't talk about rent control. People are not going to support you. The opposite happened. People couldn't get enough of it. And now I, I'm asked by people, you know, on the bus, when I go on the bus, somebody uh, uh, you know, nudged me and said, why aren't you talking about rent control? Why are you just talking about minimum wage? It shows you that people's morale is raised, confidence is raised, and they don't want to just stop there. They want to do other things too. So we have to fight for the in the best, we get the best will possible. But we will not get everything we want, no doubt. But then we have to fight for increased subsidies and point out that we need the subsidies, not more. You know, we have a much larger battle coming up, and we have to prepare for it. Thank you so much.